So in all of our locations, let's go ahead and dive in here. Love live streaming venue upstairs, other locations. Let's take our Bibles, get under the weight of the word. Find Colossians chapter one, would you? I'm really thankful for our team last week, Pastor Travis and others who uh, gave us such a quality introduction to this prison epistle. Uh, we're able to read the entire letter at one sitting as a congregation. I think that's very helpful to understanding the, the overall flow of things. And now today we're going to unpack the first eight verses. And what we're going to see in these first eight verses really is that this is more of a master class on prayer. Now, maybe you've heard of a master class. You've seen it advertised. Maybe you've been to one. Uh, we're going to enroll in this one for two weeks. It really goes through verse 14. You're going to find that prayer seems to be the primary topic in these first two sections, which really are two sentences. Do you know that? Verses 3 to 8 is one sentence in the original and 9 to 14. So there's just two sentences. And Paul really does a great job of elevating and escalating not only the need for prayer and how it occurs, but then how we are to actually pray as well. So we're going to be diving into that for two weeks. And this makes sense. One of the things that God has been doing in our body for a number of years, I would say over a decade now, is just embedding prayer more deeply into our DNA. It's been a long journey. It's been a welcomed one, but it's not easy. And we've learned to just embrace this simple truth. I think you know it. You've heard it. Finish it for me. Prayer is our... You got it. And it's become something we just say a lot. Prayer is our first and best action. It doesn't mean we shouldn't do something else or more things. Surely we should. But we can't not pray. And so we go to our knees and we make prayer our first and best action. If you're curious how that's proving increasingly true, I'd remind you that beginning the last Friday of April and going for about five months, we're going to be gathering at the Smith's home just for a night of prayer for the nations. And those who want to come pray for our partners in different regions. Uh, one of our partners who's returned home, she'll be leading this prayer time. The Smith's home just for the nations and those who don't know Christ in least access areas. It'll be fantastic. Also this summer, you're going to hear and see uh, various opportunities for those who are ill and sick and would desire healing to come and have prayer with the elders with faith that God would heal if that's his will. So we don't want to back away from the power of prayer. Amen. And so we do believe it's our first and best action. And in this passage today, we're going to see a good bit about prayer. What you'll find most striking, I think, is that this prayer, as well as the one we'll see next week, 9 to 14, really centers around the person and work of Christ. I say that to you because often we think prayer, and I'm just going to kind of go ahead and get the conviction point out there early. We often think prayer centers around us. We bring our list. It's our timetable. Here's our needs. But Paul here, this week and next, in this master class, he's centering his call to prayer, his exhortations to pray around the person and work of Christ. We're going to see Christ's preeminence even in our prayer life. So to see that, can we go to our lab this morning? Let's look at chapter 1, verses 1 to 8. Let me read all of the verses for you, and then we'll come back in a moment and uh, just look at 3 to 8. We'll pull the lab up on the screen if we can. Follow along with me as I read Colossians 1, 1 to 8. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints in Christ at Colossae, who are faithful brothers and sisters, grace to you and peace from God our Father. There's the introduction, kind of a greeting. He now dives into his first full sentence. You're going to see the English translation break them up into multiple sentences. But in the Greek translation that was um, in the original documents, it was really just one of Paul's famous run-on sentences, okay? <laughs> Here's how we translate it best. We, also, we always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we, say it with me, church, pray for you. For we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints because of the hope reserved for you in heaven. You've already heard about this hope in the word of truth, the gospel, 
that has come to you is bearing fruit and growing all over the world, just as it has among you since the day you heard it and came to truly appreciate God's grace. You learned this from Epaphras, our dearly loved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and he has told us about your love in the Spirit. Now, we're stopping here. As you look to verse 9, it again picks up Paul's admonition about prayer. That he's going to keep praying. This week, he talks about thankful prayer. Next week, continuing prayer. So let's unpack these eight verses, session one of Paul's master class on prayer, and see what it would show us. You know, in verse 3, you notice the verb there, thank, followed by the proper noun, God. This really is the main verb of the paragraph. So I would encourage you in your journals, in your Bible, just circle thank God. It's the primary exhortation. Everything flows from this verb. It kind of stair steps either upward or downward, but this is the fundamental exhortation. You may call it um, the imperative or the real key part of the text. Notice he uses the word we, meaning he and Timothy mentioned in verse one, and he does not make any bones about how often he does this. He always thanks God. Of course, he references God here as the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says he thanks God when he prays for them. So praying and thanking God would be synonymous in this sentence, this section. But notice something that often we miss. And I want to make sure I address this. Because often we unintentionally read something into the text that isn't there. This text does not say that Paul thanked God for them. Now, I don't think it's wrong to thank God for other believers, amen? It's not improper, it's not incorrect, but if we just let the text speak to us, what does the Bible say? This verse is Paul's testimony that he thanks God not for them, but because of them. So he's not hearing of what they're doing and how they're living and clapping for them. He's hearing and being reported to and, and knowing what they're doing, and he's praising God, he gets vertical really quickly. He thanks God, if I can say it this way to you, for God. Like when he hears about what God has done in their life, he thanks God for God's work. He, he's, he's so clearly like, God, what you've done is amazing, it's miraculous, it's magnificent. He's, he's not in this text at least, thanking them. He's thanking God for what God did. So hold on to that. Notice also why he thanks God. The text says, because he had heard of their faith in Christ Jesus and the love they have for all the saints. So, these two things were feeding his gratitude to God. You, you notice the word heard there, indicating to us that Paul apparently was getting these reports either first or second hand. This is further proof that Paul never visited Colossae. He didn't meet these people. He didn't plant this church. Probably Epaphras did, but he was close to the people who planted it. He was aware of the situation and he heard about their faith in Christ Jesus and their love for all the saints. One is a vertical position, faith in Christ, and one's a horizontal action, love for the saints. And I want to remind you, the vertical feeds the horizontal. It's because of the vertical that we even want to do the horizontal. And Paul here is saying, I hear of your faith in Christ and of your love for the saints and it, it, it propels me to thank God when I pray for you. As you think about this action happening in Paul's life, hearing of God's work in their life by his supernatural um, um, you know, development of faith and love in their life, and he heard about it, and then that makes him thank God, this is probably something you've experienced. Now, what you did with it may still be, uh, maybe something you can share later, but just don't, you've experienced this. When you've heard or seen something that God did in someone's life and, 
and your heart immediately just was, was overjoyed. Did you thank God? Did you thank them? Now, I'm not saying you can't thank them, but which did you do first and what did you do most? Jill and I were in Costco. I think it was just right before Easter. And I ran into an old friend, a friend I knew even before we planted First Family. Was in ministry with us here in this area. Not too long after we planted, um, he just had a terrible, um, sinful situation. Tragic. And uh, repented. Was restored. It was years ago. I kind of was aware of the situation. Was grieved, but was thankful that he had repented. The church had restored him. And, but I haven't run into him in years. And I saw him in Costco. And so we just started talking. Admittedly, at first, a little nervous. You can probably imagine. But as he shared more of his growth and his vibrancy and his humility was just so evident. As I saw this repentance that just blanketed his life and this restoration and his revival that was occurring. I mean, we just had a beautiful conversation. God was just all over him, the Holy Spirit flowing out of him. You could tell this man was genuinely repentant. Years had passed, genuinely restored and fully serving God again in a beautiful fashion, impacting others, a beautiful father and a husband. We said goodbye and standing there in Costco, probably near a sample somewhere, right? <laughs> I said to Julie, don't you love how God changes people? And our hearts in that moment just were praising God for the beautiful work in this man's life. Just last Tuesday, we were at the elders meeting. We're praying for you all. We're reading the scriptures. We're studying through Colossians. And Scott Searsan shares with us how just recently he ran into an old friend as well. This gentleman had been through a set of circumstances that was not his fault, but he endured the situation and the consequences. And when that was going on, Scott shared, I thought it might be the end of him. I thought he might not recover spiritually. But he said, I ran into him, and the man is doing better than ever. He just let God work in his life through the trials, and he's closer to God. He's on fire for the Lord. And you should have heard Scott's voice. He goes, man, I was so glad God did this for that gentleman. So, so that's what it looks like. It's not foreign to you all. The question is, when we hear of God's work in people, are we quick to thank them, or are we quick to thank God? And I want us to see this text and all of its power and be moved to pray thankfulness to God when he works in people. Because if we, if, we, if we don't, if we think, oh, good job, Craig. Great job, Dan. What we'll do is we'll just be commending what possibly could be just turning over a new leaf. Or behavior modification. Or someone just turned a good corner. And what I want to blow wind on and give thanks for is the work of God. Amen. Now maybe you're wondering, Todd, where did this faith and love come from? What sparked this faith and love that Paul heard about? Well, notice what he says next in the text. You see another transition word. Because of the hope reserved for you in heaven. That's a beautiful phrase, isn't it? He says they'd already heard about this hope, so we see it mentioned twice here, connect those two things. This hope is described as something reserved and something in heaven. So here we have a communication of a fixed objective reality that isn't fully known yet. Are you following me? So something is confidently in place. It's being held and it's real. It's the hope in heaven. So the sense is that there is a time coming when this hope that's fully fixed in heaven will be fully realized on earth. It's the coming of Christ. It's called our blessed hope by Paul, other places. I think Peter says that if you have this hope in you, you purify yourself. So this is referencing theologically, biblically, contextually to the coming of Christ when he brings and consummates God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. 
Currently, it's a hope reserved, fixed in heaven for us. Now watch this. This hope that these believers in Colossae had was so powerful and so objectively real to them that it affected their current reality in a bigger, greater way. In fact, I almost say to you this, that this hope in heaven is objective and fixed and your current reality is subjective and temporary. But I don't think that's technically accurate because your current reality is objective. It's not subjective like it's not real, like it's not happening, like, you know, uh, something like that. It's actually objective. It's a reality you can touch and feel. But can I say to you, it's not as fixed and objectively secure as the one in heaven. How do I know that? Because James says to us that your reality is like a vapor. Here's your objective current reality. And it's gone. He says that you do not know what the next day could bring. So you think you're in control of your reality? You think it's pretty objective and fixed like it can't change? You don't know what tomorrow brings forth, do you? So it's not subjective in the sense that it's made up, but it's not as objective as the hope fixed for you, reserved for you in heaven that's guaranteed to come when Christ comes. That's why they could bank on Christ, faith in Christ, and they could love the saints because they knew that what they were doing wasn't just for the here and now. Their life, their endeavors, their activities were really fueled from and aimed at the hope reserved in heaven. That reality, being more objective and more fixed, informed their current reality. Amen? And that's how it should be for us. What gives us faith and love? What produces stamina and endurance? It's the truth, the reality that Jesus Christ came, ascended to the Father, is coming again to consummate the kingdom he inaugurated when he came the first time. That's a reality that is fixed in heaven for us that causes us now to live in certain ways in the here and now. So when we know this hope, it fuels a certain kind of life that then when others hear about it, they thank God. Are you following? You tracking with me? See that progression there? Don't lose me. Our hope in heaven, that objective fixed reality that is more secure than what you're experiencing currently feeds and fuels a certain kind of life that others hear about and they see that. Man, God's working in your life. Thank God. So we just ask one more question then. Where did they hear about this hope? Here's where it gets really exciting. He says here, you've already heard about this hope in the word of truth, the gospel. Now watch how the gospel, for the most part, takes up the rest of this paragraph. He says the gospel has come to you. So that's the personal aspect of the gospel. It's very singular in the sense that it's about a location. It's plural in this technical grammatical form, but it's singular. It, it came to Colossae. It came to you people. It is bearing fruit. There's a pronoun referring to the gospel. It's bearing fruit and growing all over the world. So it's personal and it's global. Notice what he says here. He says the gospel bears fruit. He may be referring here to the faith and love mentioned earlier. He said it's growing. That means it's expanding. I like these words. Just jot these down, would you? This verse says that the gospel is productive and reproductive. So if you ever needed any proof, if you need any evidence that a church should be about multiplication, that a church should be about spiritual reproduction, here it is. The gospel actually does this to us as we dive deeper into it and treasure it and see it, uh, you know, taking place, it produces things in us and it actually reproduces itself from us. Personal, it's global. Paul said here that it has done this, notice again, it 
has done this since the day you heard it and then came to truly appreciate the words there be to fully recognize, to understand. It's like the scales fall off, the eyes are open. God's grace. So connect God's grace to gospel. So pray and thank go together. Um, Hope, of course, goes to hope. And then, of course, God's grace and gospel. This is the gospel. God's grace seen in Jesus Christ, who came, he lived, died, was raised from the dead, ascended to the Father, and is now waiting to return to consummate his kingdom. That's all God's grace, meaning you didn't earn it, plan it, or deserve it, but you get to receive it. Amen, church? That's God's grace. And they heard about it. It came to them. It bore fruit in them. It's growing all over the world. So this gospel is not stymied by distance. You should be glad to hear that. Because you're on the far end of Acts 1.8. We hear Acts 1.8. We often think about, you know, okay, the gospel should ripple out from us. And I think in conceptual principle form, I'm okay with that. But the verse in its truest context means the gospel rippled out to you. You weren't in Jerusalem. You weren't part of the ones who were near to begin with. You were the ones in the uttermost part of the earth. But the gospel bore fruit and it spread to Antioch, Colossae and Philippi, Macedonia, Rome. Then it went west and somewhere some folks in Ankeny, Iowa heard the gospel. (laughs) Hallelujah, church. Amen. That the gospel came to us, bore fruit in us, and it needs to continue to grow out from us in a multiplying, reproducing fashion. Paul said that they learned of this, speaking of God's grace, which is the gospel from Epaphras. So that's my clue that he was probably their church planter at least their church leader, perhaps their pastor. He's called a dearly loved fellow servant. And he's a faithful minister of Christ, which is interesting. If you read back in verses one and two, Paul calls all of the saints in Colossae faithful. And now he's just giving a personal example of here's one of the faithful ones. And he says, he told us about your love in the spirit. Can I have an aside for a moment? Do you see the phrase love in the spirit? Do you remember our series through the fruit of the Spirit? Galatians 5, 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is, say it. First one's love. Paul here again, just affirming the way the Holy Spirit works in us and the fruit he produces. You ought to jot Galatians 5, 22 in your margin, in your journal. And so here Paul is just showing us the incredible vast reach and impact of the gospel. And he's saying, when that gospel came to you and it bore its fruit, you realize that there's more to this life than just this life. And you begin to live this life in light of the next life. You knew your hope in heaven was fixed, objective, secure. It was coming. And so you lived your life in light of that day. That meant you had faith in Christ that endured. You had love for the saints that was exhibited. I heard about that. And so when I pray for you, I thank God. See, that's the passage kind of in uh, reverse form. So often we read the first verse and we think, man, I'm going to just thank God more in my prayer. The problem is what fuels thankfulness? It's the gospel's work. And if you're not aware of it, in tune with and cognizant of the gospel's work, both personally, globally, regionally, if you're not in touch with how God is changing people through his gospel, you you may have reason to give thanks, but it will probably be a little self-focused. Like, God, thanks for keeping me out of a wreck. Thanks for paying my bills. And you have all these kind of like just personal thank yous. Nothing sinful about that, but would you admit with me it's kind of limited? It's a little self-focused. But what if your thank you list was all about God's global and personal work in others? And every time you heard about it, you realize that that's what the gospel does. I thank God for his gospel. That's what the word does. I thank God for God. 
and you were vertical and your hands and your voice went straight to the Lord. You weren't unappreciative of people, but, but, but you want to get above them quickly because it was God doing the work. That's what drives us to pray with thankfulness. Let me show it to you in a couple of diagrams that will just give you another way to take all the markings and make sense of them. Whether you see it like a target or whether you see it like a foundation, just more ways to kind of get the gist of the passage. Like if your bullseye is thankful prayer to God, then make sure that you're starting, that you're coding, that you're surrounding all your thankfulness with the gospel's work. What is God doing? Look, and listen. And as you hear and as you're aware, then thank God. Make sense? If it's a foundation, you want to kind of climb to the top of the building, thankful prayer to God, fantastic. But that building sits on a solid foundation. It's called the gospel. And you got to be aware of what it does and how it works. And when you see it happening, then your heart cries out to God, thank you. So regardless of your diagram or just the text, I, I think it's clear. <laughs> we arrive at a posture of deeper thankfulness in our prayer when we're made aware of the gospel's work in those around us. So why don't we put this into a simple sentence, can we? Kind of wrap this up from diagrams and markings and multiple sentences. If you really want to get deep in thankful prayer, you got to get to the bottom of the gospel. So we'll say it like this. We pray thankfully because we know the gospel works powerfully. You cannot divorce those two. Your prayer life will exponentially go deeper when you're aware of how the gospel is working in the lives of people. Now, keep in mind, this is a relationship of degree, or you could say proportion. So you will do the first to the degree or in proportion to how you pursue the second. If you're nonchalant about hearing about the work of the Lord, <clears throat> asking about the work of the Lord, looking for ways God is working, You'll be nonchalant about thankful prayer. You don't end up with a deeply thankful prayer life if you have a lazy investigative life about the gospel's work. So this is a, this is a relationship of degree proportion. I would encourage you, consider both vital to your spiritual health. You may say, well, Todd, how can I do that? How can I pursue the second, so I really experience the first. Let me give you three Todd's tips. Ask, share, and thank. Let me kind of walk you through some ways that these would show up in your life. I'll tell you some stories from my life just briefly, some ways that's shown up. Yours are probably better, but they'll give you an example of like, okay, I can do that, or that's kind of what's happening. First of all, just ask, What's God been doing in your life? Now, I admit to you, that's a hard question to begin a conversation with. Even if it's someone you know pretty well, we typically start with like the weather, sports, scores, you know, situations, schedules, the kids. You can name your subject. Those are typically good on-ramps. Wouldn't you agree? And nothing wrong with that. So that's, that's humanity. But here's what we often do. We often stop with the weather the kids, our schedules, the scores. We never move on to what is more important. You see, we, we stay in the somewhat objective reality that we can't control, and that forms the basis for most of our conversations as opposed to trying to move to talking about the hope reserved in heaven, that more objective, secure reality that informs our life. So can I encourage you to try this? 
as you talk about different things to begin a conversation at some point when the time is right. And it's more right than you know, by the way. Just say, hey, and how, how's the things with the Lord this week? Or, hey, what's God done for you this week? Hey, is there something I can pray for you this week? Or any blessings you want to share this week? I mean, that's just four examples. You've probably got 40 more you can make up between now and lunch. Think of some questions that would move the conversation in a way that we can begin to see the work of God and his gospel in our life so that we can thank God, right? That's the goal. But you've got to ask those kind of questions. I was with our church planters Thursday and Friday. <clears throat> um, we meet once a year. Spend about a day and a half, two days together, just talking about the last year, looking at the next year. And really, it's just an accountability retreat. There's no authority between our church plants and us, but we do love each other. It's a relational network. And so we just meet this way to encourage each other here and pray together. And it's amazing that in that environment, uh, like usually like Friday morning, we start talking about all kinds of stuff and it takes one of us to kind of steer the conversation towards like, so, so how are things with your life personally with the Lord? Or, hey, how's your wife doing with the whole church pastor thing and God? How's that? It, it just doesn't come up naturally, even among pastors. That's what I'm saying. One of us has to kind of prompt the next discussion about how we're doing spiritually. What's God doing? How's the gospel landing? And my sense is if seven pastors can't get there pretty quickly, that's probably hard for most people, right? So I'm just giving you some questions to use. I'm in the boat with you. It's not easy, but it's surely worthwhile to ask those kinds of questions that come from the hope reserved for us in heaven as opposed to always just repeating things about the situation on earth. So ask Second of all, share. When I jotted this note down, I thought of the verse in Psalms, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. It's a call from the psalmist to speak up about the works of God. So whether it's your family, <clears throat> excuse me, your own life, uh, and the, the lives of those you see, just start sharing. If you take this posture, what I'm saying to you is you may not need a question. You could just say, hey, can I share something God did for me this week? Boom, there you go. You let them off the hook, and you can just start sharing, right? I heard about someone in one of our small groups. I don't know who it is. I love this report. It made my heart rejoice in God when I heard it. But this person said to their small group leader, I don't even know, really, I don't know who it is. But in their small group, they were going around asking, who's reading their Bible? How's it going? And this person said later, I've never been asked how my Bible reading's going till this church. Now, I don't want to congratulate us. I don't want to pat us on the back. That's a work of the Lord. Amen. That's God continuing to weigh on us the importance of his word. That it's what does the work. And someone in one of our small groups, they just said, hey, how's your Bible reading going? Is it, you know, you doing okay? You work it? And this person said, I've never been asked that question in all my years in churches till this one. So I'm so thankful to God for a brave small group, aren't you? Who could ask and then be willing to share. That's how we begin to hear the work of the Lord so that we can then thank God when we pray. That is the last of the Todd's tips, is just thank God. Often, and I'm going to be very pastorally vulnerable here with you, often we we stop just short of thanking God and we thank people. And I may be misheard here, so be it. I'm not against appreciating people. We should. The Bible says to honor those among us who serve the Lord and work hard. We should be grateful for people's service. But it shouldn't stop there. We're not trying to pad people's egos. We're not trying to make sure somebody doesn't quit We'll be out of volunteers next week. Like sometimes all of our motivations are just short-sighted. I want us to get 
to the place where we're secure enough as a people that we can serve the Lord and expend ourselves and give. And when God gets all the credit, no one's worried about that. That all of our gratitude does keep climbing the ladder and it results in giving thanks to God. So let's do that. When you hear about God's work in someone's life, say, I thank God for how he's worked in your life. You can say, I feel like I'm giving you permission. Forgive me, that's not my point here. But perhaps you want to say something like, hey, I love the way you've been really submissive to God's voice and God's hand. I'm glad that God is drawing you closer. I'm glad that God's working. In other words, just don't let it stop with the person. Because if God wasn't working, they wouldn't be doing what they're doing. God is at work, so let's thank him. And as we ask, share, and thank, here's what I think will happen. This will prove true in our midst. The people of God, hearing the works of God, will experience more and more the wonder and worship of God. And when God is big in your midst and people are little, that's an exciting time to pray. Pray into a God so big you can't describe him. You can't comprehend him. You can't fathom him, but you pray to him because of all you see him doing. That's an exciting prayer meeting. Amen, church? And so I'm calling all of us in Paul's first week of this master class of prayer to not divorce our prayer life from the gospel's work and to be more cognizant and aware of what God is doing so that it fuels our thankfulness to him in prayer. Because thankful prayer is connected to the gospel's powerful work.